Hey, how you doing? This is Craig Beck, aka the Stop Drinking Expert. Welcome in to another live stream. I don't know, you wait a month for one and then you get two. That's the way it goes. Um, the reason I just wanted to jump in and do a live stream today uh, is because of something that happened this morning. I've got to share it with you uh, because I think uh, it's applicable. I think it's interesting. Um, so welcome into the live stream, no matter where you're watching, whether that's on YouTube, on Twitch, on Facebook, I can see your comments. So comment below. Uh, if you've got any questions at all, ask away. I will do my very best to answer. Also, if you are sober, and you come here for a bit of reinforcement, then share your tips, share your advice, share your story. What worked for you? What didn't work for you? Because we are one family here. You know, I always start boot camp by saying, because people come to boot camp and they look a bit awkward, a bit shy, nervous. And I always say, you know, look around the room. Everyone in this room is in the same boat. And that's what this YouTube channel is about. There's nobody here better than anyone else. We're all on a different stage of the journey, but we're all struggling with the, the same problem. So, um, look, what I wanted to talk about today was um, I've been doing this for over 10 years now. Uh, probably about 11 years I've been helping people to stop drinking uh, drink alcohol. Um, I know a lot about it because I've met a lot of people who've shared their experiences. And I've been through a lot. It took me 10 years to work this out. Uh, so, I know all the excuses, I know all the gimmicks, I know all the lies, I know all the things that we tell ourselves that we just do to make ourselves feel better. I know it all because I've been there and I've done it. Um, O'Neill, good morning, welcome. Angela, can't get past day one after doing three months. Stay with me, Angela. So I know a lot about alcohol and I've helped a lot of people to quit drinking, probably hundreds of thousands of people. And, if, you know, you don't need to take my word for that. You can go to Trustpilot. Um, and there are 1,392 reviews here. 4.9 is the average. Most people give a five-star review. <laughs> Occasionally, some people put a bad review, but I don't think they mean to. Linda Lou has basically left me a one-star review here because she couldn't find the back button. Thanks, Linda. Um, but if you just scroll through, you'll see this is changing people's lives. I know it works. I've seen it work. Just keep scrolling through and you'll see people raving about it. In fact, generally, the only people who leave a bad review of my course do so by mistake by the look of it. Look, there's one here. Um, there was one. There we go. Two-star review from Tracy. So I saw that and I thought, oh, my God, Tracy hates it. And then I read it. Great way to start the course. Making me mindful of the choices I want to make for my future. Excellent. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. Two stars. <laughs> so I said, hey, Tracy, you seem happy. So maybe a two-star review is a mistake. But generally, people are pretty happy. So why am I telling you that? I'm not boasting. It's just that I got, um, I got an email this morning from a lady, and she was desperate. She emailed me, and she said, uh, Craig, help me. I've tried everything, and nothing works. Help me. So I checked the member database and she wasn't there. So I emailed her back and said, uh, have you done the course? She replied, no, I don't want to do the course. Just help me. I can't carry on like this. Help me. And I said, I can't help you. And then she fired some uh, abuse at me. Now, the reason I can't help her or someone like that is because if you want the end result without putting the work in, you're deluded. You're not going to make it because that's insane. And I'm sure you, you know, if you watch enough of my videos, you know that I'm not the sort of coach who's going to hold your hand and have a pity party with you and spend half an hour talking about how terrible it is and how awful it's all been for you. And no wonder you drink because you've had so much to deal with, blah, blah, blah. That's not because I'm not empathetic. I understand how painful this process can be. It's just that I, I also know that spending hours agreeing how awful it is achieves nothing. And that's not just about quitting drinking. It's about everything. You know, if we, if we sit down and talk about not having enough money, we can spend hours talking about how the system is corrupt and the government is against us and the boss is an arsehole and, you know, the whole, the whole 
uh, pack of cards is stacked against us. We can spend hours talking about that, but at the end, you will not be even close to 1% richer. So what's the point? It might make you feel good. It might make you feel better about me as a person. You might say, hey, what a nice guy, but it doesn't achieve the outcome that you want, and that is to live a happy, sober life. And here's the harsh reality of this, right? The only way you will quit drinking is if you take 100% responsibility for doing so. 100%. Not 99. Not, well, you know, if my husband wasn't so horrible to me, then maybe I wouldn't drink. That's not, it's an irrelevance. You got to take 100% responsibility. And that really is the difference between people who succeed and the people who fail. And you can go to my Facebook group, the Stop Drinking Expert Facebook group, and you'll see people there posting up one year sober, two years sober, five years sober. And you can also see other people saying, I can't even get one week sober. It doesn't mean that the people who got sober are better or got access to different information. It's just a mindset thing. It's about, it's about honestly looking at yourself and saying, I got myself into this situation and only I can get myself out of this situation. I know this is tough because, you know, I've met a lot of people who've been through hell, people who've been through situations that make you want to cry when you hear the story and you think, well, you know, I, I can see why you went looking for something to help. And the evil clown that is alcohol said, hey, yeah, I can help you with that. And then you got trapped in the loop. And you can acknowledge all that pain, but you kind of got to put it in a box and say, I'm moving on regardless. Because I get so many emails from people reaching out to me, and you can tell from the wording of their email, what they want is a magic tablet. They, wanna, they want me to fire a silver bullet at them where they do nothing, but miraculously, their problem disappears. And it sounds stupid when you say it out loud. You, you might think, well, why would, any, why would anyone be so naive? But sadly, so many people are so tunnel visioned about this problem that they can't see that the problem exists within themselves and they go looking for an external solution. This is why people want, you know, they want prescription medication. They, they hope that there's some sort of tablet the doctor can give them that makes it all go away. There isn't. And if there is, ever is, it will come with such hideous side effects that the side effects will be just as bad as the problem you started with, because that's how humanity does medicine, right? So I really just wanted to say that if you want to be successful in quitting drinking and staying sober, you have to do a little audit of your thinking. Imagine that I'm sitting with you one-to-one -one right now and I say to you, why do you drink? If you have a response to that pre-prepared, if you know instantly what you would say to me if I asked you that question, then you have a excuse. You have um, something like plausible deniability pre-prepared. Craig, I drink because, well, you know, uh, I used to be a mom and then the kids left home and now I'm home alone. You've got an excuse. And it's not going to serve you. It might make you feel better when you say it to yourself or when someone questions your drinking, but it's not going to help you. Craig, I drink because I work a very stressful job and my boss is an asshole and, well, when I get home, it's the only way I can relax. It sounds laudable. And nobody's going to argue with you and say, well, you know, no, you don't. That's you're making it up because it sounds very believable. Great. Good for you. But it's not going to get you the outcome you want. It's not going to get you sober. And so that's the first thing I want you to do. I want you to do a little audit, a little cross examination of yourself. Ask yourself, why do you drink? And if you have an answer ready, you got to get rid of that answer. You got to stop using it because as long as you're using that response to that question, you're going to put an obstacle in your way. I hope this isn't sounding too tough, you know, um, but it is the harsh reality and there's no point sugarcoating it.
let's say hello to a few people. Uh, I can see your comments, by the way. If you've just joined in on the stream and we have a few people watching now, um, wherever you're watching, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, there's uh, a new channel. You can comment and I will see it. Um, Potato21CR. Firstly, I want to know how you came up with your username. Hi, Craig. I keep stopping and then starting drinking again. I generally drink when I feel deflated, upset, or angry. Yeah, you know, it's really common um, because it's an anesthetic. And so it, um, it makes you less aware of your state. So the problem here, Potato, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, sorry. <laughs> the problem here is your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is always looking to automate life because it understands that your conscious mind is so weak and pathetic that it has to take as many things off it as possible. Otherwise, it just you just wouldn't be able to get through the day. For example, the simple act of taking your finger and moving it from out here in front of you to your nose requires the coordination of about 57 different muscles in a very specific order. Can you imagine how long it would take you to consciously move your finger to your nose if you had to think about every one of those 57 muscles? It would take you like hours, wouldn't it? And you would look like a stroke victim. So your subconscious mind says, don't worry about that. I'm going to create a program to facilitate this action. You can do it now without even thinking about it. It is a program. So your subconscious mind is watching for things that you do all the time so it can create a routine that saves you having to consciously do it in the future. Yeah. So now, Potato, what you've got is you've been angry, you've been depressed and sad and all these other negative states so many times in the past, and your solution to it every single time has been to drink alcohol. And it's like Pavlov and his dogs. You've done it so many times that your subconscious mind has gone, okay, this is a recurring pattern. It's pretty predictable. Let's not bother thinking this through anymore. Let's create a subconscious routine. So now what happens, again, it's like Pavlov when he rang his bell. Now when you feel upset or stressed or depressed or any other negative state, without asking for it, without even being aware of it, the alcohol program runs in your head. And you get a sensation that you vocalize as, oh, I could do with the drink. This is your subconscious mind effectively running a, a program that is going to kill you. And you might think, well, why would my own subconscious mind try to kill me? And the answer to that question is your subconscious mind does not judge or question anything. It just does. Your conscious mind judges everything. It's always judging. How hot is that pan on the stove? How fast is that car approaching? How attractive is that girl? How attractive is that man? It's always judging everything. But your subconscious mind judges nothing. It has no opinion. It just runs the program in your head. And if you think about it, that's actually a life-saving feature. Because imagine if you're crossing the road and a car comes hurtling towards you. And what you really want is your subconscious mind to activate the run command. You want to run to the other side of the road as quickly as possible. What you don't want is the subconscious mind going, uh, are you sure about it? Which foot should we use first, the right or the left? I think the right's better. You don't want any of that dialogue. You just want the program to run. So, Potato, you've got these programs in your head. They run automatically, and there's nothing you can do about them unless you're aware of them. And in the course, what I talk about is my four things. There are four things you can do to stop these programs running. And if you do the four things and you commit to it long enough, then these programs fade away to nothing, and they stop being a problem. It's fascinating. It really works. I'm missing a lot of people here. Um, Warrior Mohawk, I can't sleep without alcohol. <laughs> you got yourself an excuse. Uh, well, look, you've taught yourself to use a mild anesthetic to go to sleep. That doesn't mean that you're having good quality sleep. In the same way that Michael Jackson taught himself to only be able to get to sleep by having a doctor come around and give him a general anesthetic. 
does anyone watching now think that Michael Jackson had had a great idea? Of course not. Eventually it killed him. Alcohol may help you get to sleep because it is a mild anesthetic, but it, it will actually destroy your sleep. And we've talked about this many times before. Alcohol, if and you, you don't even need to take my word for this. You can prove it to yourself. Get one of those Fitbits or um, you know Apple Watches with a sleep monitor on, okay? And you take a look at your sleeping behavior, sober and drunk. I guarantee you, when you look at the results for a drunken night's sleep, it will give you a terrible score. It will say you had virtually no REM sleep. You had very shallow, um, less restorative sleep. So I understand where you're coming from, but it, it is an illusion, just like all the other uh, justifications to drink alcohol. Sleep, it's an illusion. It's not real. Hi, Jonathan. Good morning. Um, uh, I drink red wine all day. I would love to quit, but the panic attacks. Let's have a look at this one. Interesting username. Uh, I drink red wine all day. I would love to quit, but the panic attacks because of anxiety and think I'll die in my sleep make me uh, scared too. Okay. Again, we've talked about this before. Um, alcohol does not cure anxiety. Alcohol creates anxiety. So it's a bit like, um, to my ears, when you say this to me, when you say I need to drink because of my anxiety, it's a bit like someone saying to me, oh, Craig, I've got to drink caffeine because uh, I need it to sleep. It, it's like, ah! But I do understand why you're doing it because this is how alcohol works. It gives you, it gives you short-term relief, but the long-term pain is dramatically out of kilter. It's dramatically more than the benefit that you got in the short, in the short run. The, the analogy I always make is that it's like going to a loan shark to cure your debt problem. You know, if you're heavily in debt, you can't make uh, the ends, you know, can't get to the end of the month um, with any money intact. And you go to a loan shark and you take out a loan. It's true that initially life is better. You pay your bills, you have a bit of spare cash, you can treat yourself, everything's looking good. But that doesn't last, does it? And in fact, the problem you end up with as a result of your action is significantly worse than the problem you started with. And then if you go to another loan shark to cure the second problem you've created, can you see how you get into a spiral downwards? And that's exactly what happens with anxiety. If you drink to cure your anxiety that then creates more anxiety, you are now in a downward spiral. Anxiety and alcohol are two separate things. you got to remove the alcohol from your life and then, but don't just stop there. If you remove alcohol, you're still going to have anxiety, but now you haven't got your coping mechanism. So now you, you're no better off. You've got to go and get some help with your anxiety and treat it as a separate entity. It is not connected to your alcohol. It's, it's, it's a separate thing. It's coming from somewhere else. So go and get that sorted. But trust me, the longer you keep alcohol in the loop, the deeper down the cycle you're going to go. Thank you for the comment, though. Um, uh, Johnny Cola, I've been tempted to feel like drinking again. I've always suffered depression badly my whole life. It's the same story, Johnny. Um, you know, alcohol causes depression. It is a depressive agent. Um, so the, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they quit drinking is they don't do anything else. Quitting drinking is step one in a really big process in your life because when you get alcohol out of your life, you're going to have the clarity to see the damage that it's done. You're going to be able to look at your health, your relationships, your career, your finances, and you will be able to see what decades of alcohol use has done to all these areas of your life. Now, if you do nothing else apart from look at the devastation before you, that's pretty depressing. You're going to get really depressed 
your health's poor, your relationship's terrible, your career's going nowhere, you're in a financial mess, and so on and so on. Oh my God, I'm so depressed, I better start drinking again. Quitting drinking, removing alcohol from your life is step one. Step two is working on all these areas of your life that you have neglected for decades. And it, that doesn't mean it's easy, it's not. You know, when I quit drinking, uh, I changed career completely. I was a broadcaster. I changed from being a broadcaster to being a photographer because my broadcasting career was going nowhere. It had been for 10 years. I just I threw my career away and said, I'm starting again. I'm a photographer. And I worked as a wedding photographer. My marriage ended. I got divorced. I moved 2,000 miles away to a new country. I blew up my life. Because it was such a mess. I said, Look, I'm just going to have to systematically go through every area of my life and fix everything. And it took a long time. But the end result, you know, 10, 11 years down the road, is that every area of my life is better. Every area of my life is better. So don't just quit drinking and leave a hole there that where the alcohol was. You have to fill it with other stuff and you have to start working on your life. You have to start seeing this as a, a turning point, but it takes time, effort, passion, and persistence. But if you give it all that, you'll be amazed at what happens to your life. Uh, <laughs> Robert Booth, hope you're well. Back into hold mode on the crypto again after Tuesday. Oh, isn't it terrible, Robert? Ah, oh, so boring. But sadly, the predictions are coming true on that. September's all traditionally a bad month for crypto. But October, November, December could be really good. So like you say, hold mode. Um, and we'll just see what the rest of the quarter has to, has to bring. Um, good point, Robert. Uh, alcohol makes... Uh, when you don't drink alcohol for a week, uh, your eyes, your face look so nice. You have a lot of energy. You save a lot of money. Loads of benefits, Robert. You're quite right. Um, what about heavy drinkers that could have serious side effects if they quit cold turkey? Possibly die. Ah, oh, yes. My, one of my favorite questions. Uh, about once a week, I get an email from someone saying, you idiot. How dare you? You're trying to kill people. Outrageous that you should suggest that people just stop drinking. You've, you've heard this story that um, quitting drinking cold turkey is potentially lethal. Could cling to this as a justification for not stopping drinking. Well, I better not stop because it might kill me. There's a little bit of truth to this story, but it's so detached from the headline that it's almost irrelevant. If you are physically addicted to alcohol, you are a fully blown alcoholic, as in you can't go more than a few hours without drinking. You wake up in the morning, you drink alcohol, and you drink all day because you can't do anything else because if you stop drinking, you start shaking and you feel terrible. You are physically addicted to alcohol. If you stop drinking suddenly, it is true, you are going to feel at best terrible. You are going to go through severe withdrawal. Now, it doesn't automatically mean that you're going to die. But if you have an underlying condition, like epilepsy or something, then quitting drinking and going through this horrendous withdrawal could trigger a grand mal seizure. And yes, that could kill you. But it's not its not a logical conclusion of your action. It's not. It doesn't make any sense to say quitting drinking kills you. It's like saying driving a car kills you. Well, yeah, it could, but it's not the logical conclusion of your action. Now, here's the thing. I don't help alcoholics. It's not my job. I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to give medical advice. I have no ability to prescribe medication. I'm not a doctor. I'm a former problem drinker. I help problem drinkers, not alcoholics. If you are physically addicted to alcohol, as in you cannot go more than a few hours without drinking or you get severe physical side effects, you don't need me. You need medical inpatient supervision. 
and you should always make any significant changes in your life under the supervision of your doctor anyway. But if you are physically addicted to alcohol, stop watching me. Go and get serious medical intervention because you are past the point where I can offer any advice for you. Now, if you're a problem drinker, the sort of person who drinks because they're stressed at work, but they can go two or three days without drinking. They can go two or three weeks without drinking. Maybe you don't even drink every day. Maybe you just binge once a week or something like that. Or you found yourself in the routine of opening a bottle of wine when the kids have gone to bed. You're in a psychological loop with your drinking, like I used to be. Then I can help you. 99.99999% of these people, when they stop drinking, the strongest withdrawal sensation they're going to feel is a sensation of mild anxiety. They're going to feel a bit jittery and on edge. And that's exactly what, that, that's basically alcohol carrot and stick. It's using a stick to hit you. It's trying to make you feel on edge because it knows what you do when you feel on edge. You say, oh, could do with a drink. And you open a bottle of beer or pour yourself a whiskey or pour a glass of wine. So the whole, you know, stopping drinking kills your routine um, line f from, you know, 99% of the people who watch my stuff, read my books, it's not relevant. But thanks for raising the question because it's a good one. Um, let's see. Alicia. Uh, let's have a look. You've opened so many doors for me. I read your book, uh, Quit Drinking, and that day before August 24th was the last day I had a drink. On August 25th, 2021, I celebrated one year sober. Read all your books and listened to your guide on meditation as well as a hypnosis audio book every day. My world has changed, and I cry with emotion for the joy I feel with so much gratitude. Thank you. I love you. Wow. Uh, thank you. Uh, couldn't ask for a better message than that, really. But awesome. One year sober. Um, just remember, Alicia, there is a there is a trap door. And I'm telling you this because I love you too. <laughs> there is a trap door around one year. Um, and I don't want you to fall through it. So I want you to remember these words, okay? You get about one year sober and something will happen. And you'll just get this kind of urge that ah, just one drink won't hurt. And you'll look back and you won't be able to remember all the horrible stuff. You'll just remember the good times. And then you'll remember how easy it was for you to quit drinking on the 24th of August. You'll think, well, I did it so easily. So maybe I wasn't even addicted at all. Maybe I didn't even have a drinking problem. And you'll be at a wedding and someone will push a glass of champagne into your hand and they'll say to toast the bride and groom. And you'll think, well, it was so easy to stop before. I'm sure one won't hurt. I'm telling you now, if you fall for this trick, if you fall for this moment, you're going to spend months fixing the problem again. It's going to take you months to get back to where you are today. It's a complete trick. So whenever you feel this come over you, I want, you, I want this moment to be ingrained in your head. I want you to think back to this YouTube moment and you go, ah, this is what he was talking about. Because those, those are the five most dangerous words on planet Earth. Just one drink won't hurt. And they are the last things you're going to hear before something very bad happens to you, Alicia. All right? The five most dangerous things on planet Earth are just one drink won't hurt. Just a little tip for you, but I'm sure you won't need it. You're doing great. Vanessa, Craig, can you see this? Yes, I can. Um, what's Granville saying? I think I drink through habit, nothing else. No trauma as far as I know. I just picked up the habit with my mates back in the day and I just carried on. Hi, all. Um, Well, that, that would make sense if alcohol wasn't the second most addictive substance on planet Earth. Yeah, a bad habit is, um, you know, when you, you fall out of the habit of going to the gym. Instead of going to the gym, you sit at home and watch Netflix every night. That's, that's a bad habit. But 
kind of minimizing this thing as, oh, I haven't got a problem. I've just got a bad habit. It might be just a deflection from, you know, it might be the evil clown trying to deflect you from focusing on this thing in your life. Granville, the, the harsh reality here is you, you have gone on the internet and you have found a YouTube channel by a guy who helps people to stop drinking, who makes videos specifically for people who are worried about their drinking. You wouldn't be here if it really wasn't that much of a big deal. You know, you're probably not signed up to a YouTube channel about people who eat too many carrots every day. Why? Because you probably don't care about carrots enough to type it into Google, right? The fact that you went to Google and you found me is a little red flag. Now, you might be right. Maybe it's just a bad habit, but there isn't a, you know, we live in an illusion in the Western world that alcohol is this harmless social pleasantry, and it, it's not. It's the second most addictive substance in the world. It's just behind heroin. Just because you can buy it in Walmart doesn't doesn't lessen the effectiveness of the drug. This drug knows what it's doing. It kills three million people every year. And, you know, it doesn't just kill stupid people. It's not like everyone who dies from alcohol just, oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to drink that much. It kills professors and geniuses just as much as it kills, you know, the other end of the spectrum. This drug knows what it's doing because it has the power of your brain uh, to use against you. You know, what it used to say to me was, you need this to relax. This is the only good thing in your life. How are you going to get to sleep if you don't have a drink, Craig? To you, it says, ah, you've just got a bad habit. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. Um, look at Louise. What a superstar. Ever, ever since I listened to your Audible, stop drinking three years on no poison in my life, three years sober. Wow. Amazing. Well done, Louise. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what this means. Tell me you want to buy a large pig. I don't, though. Um, Vanessa, August 28th, one year sober. Superstar, well done. And you have a nice cat as well. Uh, we have six cats now. Um, let's have a look. <laughs> Alex Mack, make the T-shirt and I'll buy it. The five most dangerous words. Just one drink, one hurt. The problem with... Um, with my website and what I do is nobody really wants to promote it for me. Nobody wants to go around wearing a stop drinking expert badge. <laughs> um, yeah, I could make the t-shirt Alex. I don't think many people would buy them. Um, Ron, the legend that is Ron. Wow. He's live and quite early. I heard alcohol is harder to quit than alcohol. I think you mixed up a word there somewhere. Um, 3.5 million. Yeah, it is going up. And that's, you know, that 3 million number I quoted, Ron, was uh, before the pandemic. Uh, God only knows what it is now afterwards. Um, but I can believe 3.5. Um, finding friends who hate alcohol is a big problem. Like the world is full of non-thinking alcoholic zombies. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and when you get sober friends, you have the best time. You have the best time with them. Um, but they're hard to come by. But not, not quite as hard as you think when you're drinking. Because when you're in the bubble of unreality that is alcohol, um, you start... Um, you, you assume that everyone drinks. And you assume that it's impossible to socialize without alcohol. Because that's, that's the evidence that you've seen before you. And then when you stop drinking, you start finding sober people everywhere. It's like uh, my electrician, uh, Steve, he's a great guy. Um, he's done a lot of work for me. And then occasionally, last time I saw him, he said, oh, yeah, hey, you don't drink. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, me too. Not had a drink for seven years. They're everywhere. And you have great fun without alcohol spoiling it. Uh, 
Riaz picked up alcohol again after 15 years of not drinking. It happens, Riaz. Uh, and, that, you know, 15 years isn't even the dramatic thing there. You hear about people going like 25 years, 30 years sober and then having a drink. It's it's bizarre. Um, just, you're just going to have to put a lot of effort in. Um, perhaps what you did before won't work this time because now you have doubt. You know, if it failed after 15 years, there is going to be a part of your brain saying, well, it doesn't work. So, like I said yesterday in my, my video, it, the most important thing for you to do is just keep trying different angles of attack. You know, try my course. If it doesn't work, don't say, well, that's it, nothing works. You move on to the next thing. Go to AA, go to rehab, try medication, go to your GP, try different books, try different systems, try the Sinclair method. Just make a commitment to keep on trying. That's the most important thing you can do. Uh, let's have a look here. Um, Laura, nine months sober after reading your book. Well, except for one incident when I was away. Um, yeah, and it just reminded you, yeah? You learned another lesson about how this uh, evil clown gets you. But well done, Laura. Nine months is fantastic. Um, another message from Alicia here. I drank every day, started in the morning and for 12 years. I'm 41, the best shape of my life. I will never drink again, not ever. I believe in listen to all books and advise. I'm 1,000% 1, on board. Um, I think I love your mindset, Alicia. You're in a really good place. Keep that going. A man at my gym regularly boasts never hung over T-shirt. Okay. Well, maybe. Um, <laughs> I'll buy one in every color. <laughs> yeah. I'm not Versace, you know. I'm not bringing out a range of clothing. Turkish Jade. 18 months sober. Still forgiving myself for falling for the lie of drinking. Uh, yeah, you know, don't don't be too hard on yourself, Jade. This don't. There's this kind of illusion around alcohol that people who get addicted to it are somehow weak and pathetic or stupid. And you, you know, you can test that for yourself. You, you go around and tell people that you're addicted to cigarettes. Nobody thinks you're stupid. Nobody goes, "Oh, well, you must be a bit thick." Then people understand that you know nicotine is highly addictive, and you've got addicted to a highly addictive drug. Even heroin. You tell you would confess to someone, "I got addicted to heroin." They don't think, "Oh, well, you must be. You must have done very poorly at school." Then you must be very stupid. They know that heroin is highly addictive. It's very good at what it does, and it got you. But you tell people, you know, I'm an alcoholic. Watch the pity come over their face. They're like, oh, oh you poor, terrible person. Oh, how, how awful for you. It's, it's the only drug in the world. And listen to this. It's the only drug on planet Earth where when you get a problem with it, society blames you and not the drug. That doesn't happen with any other drug. When you tell someone you've quit smoking, they don't say, yeah, great, but you're always going to be a recovering smokeaholic. You can't ever call yourself a non-smoker. You can only at best call yourself a recovering smokeaholic because there's something wrong with you. Doesn't happen, does it? Only with alcohol. You stop drinking, they say, yeah, but you're not fixed. You never will be. You're always going to be broken, you. It's garbage. So... Jade, today's the day. Draw a line in the sand. Enough. It got you. It gets many intelligent people. And now you escaped it. So pat yourself on the back and let the rest go. And just focus on living in the moment and enjoying your life because you're doing fantastic. Uh... A lot of people want me to bring out a stop drinking t-shirt. <laughs> I might do it just to see how many people would buy it. Just to, just for the thrill one day of seeing someone in the street with one of my t-shirts. And that would be pretty awesome. Uh, Granville thinks, uh, I often think AA are in cahoots with big alcohol. They always blame the individual, never themselves. I don't think so, Granville. You know, you know, I'm not a massive fan of AA. 
Um, but that's mainly because AA is not designed for me. It's designed for alcoholics. It's not designed for problem drinkers. Um, and let's not forget that, you know, there are mi probably millions of people whose lives were saved by AA. Um, for some people it works, just not for most. Um, but the whole guilt and um, labels thing was, it certainly made me drink more when I went to AA because I listened to the other people's stories around the table and I thought, my drinking seems pretty tame. So I drank more after AA. Uh, we're gonna wrap up fairly soon. Um, but I'll, I'll answer a couple more questions. Uh, let's have a look here. Shirag. Um, hi, Craig. Hello from Hong Kong. My whole social life with friends always revolves around drinking alcohol. It becomes embarrassing if I'm going to order a Coke or lime soda. Should I stop meeting? Uh, we'll stop. Uh, that's a tough question. Shirag, there, are, there is... No doubt about it. There are people that you currently call friends who are not friends. They're just people who like to do the same drug as you. Drinkers like to drink in a social group because it gives them an illusion of safety in numbers. If you can look around the room and see 20 other intelligent people also doing the same behavior as you, there is a part of your brain that seeks reassurance in that and says, well, it can't be that bad then because this guy over here is a doctor. That guy's over there. He's a lawyer. And they're, they're all really intelligent people. They're all drinking the same stuff as me. Therefore, it can't be that bad. The problem with that thinking is there is no safety in numbers when it comes to alcohol. It doesn't matter whether you drink in a bar full of 20 people or whether you drink sitting on your sofa in your underpants. It makes no difference. So you have to understand the dynamic. You know, if you're meeting regularly with this group of people and they all drink alcohol, there is a certain element to your relationship that is a self-comforting behavior. You are all comforting each other by your actions to carry on doing what you're doing. When you stand up in that group and say, well, I'm not drinking anymore, you get hostility, not because they want you to drink poison for fun, not because your drinking in any way affects them. It's just that by you raising your standards, you highlight their low standards and you cause them psychological pain. Now, they don't vocalize it as that. They don't go, oh, Shirag's caused me psychological pain. They, they just know they feel on edge and uncomfortable by something you've done. And they have two choices at this point. They can raise their standards to your level or they can bring their own standards down or they can pull you down to their low standards. And it's much easier for them to pull you down than to lift themselves up. So they'll try and embarrass you. They'll insult you. They'll try and persuade you to drink. They'll tell you things like that you're, you know, you're a party pooper and you're spoiling the fun and so on and so on. So some of the people that you hang around with who you think care about you, who think you think are friends, they're not really your friends. And if they don't like you when you're not drinking, they're not your friends. They're just other drug users that you know. And if they don't like being with you when you're sober, then it kind of shines an uncomfortable spotlight on your relationship with that person, if you ask me. You know, if you stop drinking, the reality is other areas of your life have to change as well. And a lot of people get into problems when they, when they stop drinking and assume that nothing else is going to change. Th things are going to change. You know, you'll party less. You'll socialize less because you'll find that you go to a party and by kind of 10 o'clock at night, everyone's talking nonsense, you're aware that you're tired, the noise is getting to you, and you'll want to go home to bed. And you know, the, you know, your days of staggering home at five in the morning are gone. But to me, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. That sounds like a good thing. I, I can't think of anything worse 
than getting in at five in the morning, exhausted from listening to nonsense all night. So I understand where you're coming from. Don't let other people's opinions change your, your, your course of action. If, you, if alcohol is making you miserable, then sod them. Get it out your life and then do an evaluation of who should still be in your life and how you're going to socialize and how you're going to spend your time. Okay. Um, last couple of questions. <laughs> I like that. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. How true is that? I love that. Um, all right, I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to wrap up for today. Um, let's just mention Jamie. You saved me. Thank you. I listen to you every night for months and end. Thanks again. What a positive way to end. Let me just remind you what I started uh, off this video saying. If you want to be successful at this, if you really want to quit drinking alcohol, take 100% responsibility for it. How do you know that you're taking 100% responsibility? Test yourself. Ask yourself this question. Why do I drink alcohol? If you have an answer instantly ready to go, I want you to be aware that that is an excuse and it will not get you the goal. It will not get you what you want. So it's pointless. It's worthless. It might get you a bit of sympathy from someone, but sympathy is worth nothing. Um, so put it in a box and say you're going to deal with it later. You're going to deal with alcohol first. So that excuse because I'm in a terrible relationship, because my boss is an asshole, or because uh, financially I'm in a very bad place and I'm so stressed about it. Whatever that excuse is, put it in a box, put it to one side, deal with the alcohol first and know that you're going to come back and deal with that issue at a later date. So I hope that helps. If you are worried about your drinking, then watch this. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning, no hangover. No guilt, no regret, just full of energy and vitality. That is the life that is waiting for you. And the best time to get started on this sober journey is right now. And trust me on this, I've been there and done it. I've tried everything. Every quirk, every gimmick, every rehab. I've tried AA, prescription medication, hypnosis, cold turkey, willpower. You name it, I tried it. And none of it worked. Until I worked out the secret. The mindset that you have to have if you want to kick alcohol into touch forever. Commit to your happy sober future right now. Go to the website, stopdrinkingexpert.com forward slash webinar and book your slot on the next free quit drinking coaching program. You'll even get a free copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, as a gift just for watching the webinar. If you're serious about this, make today the day you do something about it.